warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Allah khairan for attending. Inshallah, uh, we'll begin shortly after the Quran recitation. And uh, we also want to thank Sheikh Abu Abad, who came all the way from Pennsylvania to give this talk. So, Allah khairan, Sheikh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله له ملك السماوات والأرض يحيي ويميت وما لكم من دون الله من ولي ولا نصير لقد تاب الله على النبي والمهاجرين والأنصار الذين اتبعوه والأنصار الذين اتبعوه في ساعة العصرة من بعد ما كاد يزيغ قلوب فريق منهم فريق منهم ثم تاب عليهم إنه بهم رؤوف رحيم وعلى الثلاثة الذين خلفوا حتى إذا ضاقت عليهم الأرض بما رحبت وضاقت عليهم أنفسهم وظنوا وظنوا ألا من جاء من الله إلا إليه ثم تاب عليهم ليتوبوا إن الله هو التواب الرحيم سلام الله عليه وسلم بسم الله والحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب كما يحب الله تعالى ويرضى وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه ومن ومن تمسك بهديه الى يوم الدين ثم اما بعد the most truthful of all speech, and they didn't plan on translating it. So we want to translate it for myself so that y'all could benefit from the verse, inshallah ta'ala. He recited a verse that's directly related to our subject matter, which is referring to a sinner's cure and repentance and returning back to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the translation of, indeed Allah, belongs to him the dominions of the heavens and the earth. He causes life and death. And there is not for you less than Allah, any protector nor any helper. Verily, Allah has shown repentance upon the prophet and the muhajirin, the migrators, and the ansar and the helpers. Those who followed him at the moments of difficulty and hardship after their hearts were, uh, uh, the hearts of a group from amongst them was about to go astray because of the hardships. And then Allah showed repentance upon them. Verily, He is in regards to them very courteous and merciful. And it is for those three who was delayed from their repentance being accepted until the point the earth became really restricted upon them in spite of his spaciousness and their souls became restricted thinking to the point they realized that there was no rescue except, except for to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah ta'ala showed repentance upon them in order that they may repent to him indeed Allah is often showing repentance and most merciful and that's what we start this ayah that he recited from Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that, those particular ayahs, it was related to Ka'b ibn Malik, the companion of the Prophet, him and Halal, and the other companions, 
three of whom stayed back from the battle of Tabuk. And when they stayed back from that particular battle, it was others who had stayed back also who didn't participate, which was this battle was a tremendous battle that the Prophet was going to fight the people of Rome. But Allah Ta'ala had put fear in their hearts. And when the Messenger of Allah went out there to fight with them, and this was a serious war because they was fighting a superpower at that time. When the Prophet got out there and waited for 20 days for the Kufar to come, they never showed up because they was afraid of the Muslims. And so the Messenger of Allah, when he came back, the Munafiqun, the hypocrites from amongst them began to come to the Prophet with their excuses. Oh, Messenger of Allah, we got excuses. Please forgive us. We couldn't make it. But at that time, it was the summertime. And during the summertime, that was when the veggie, the fruits began to grow and the farmers began to profit much from what they had and enjoy their fruits. And so what took place during that time, they didn't want to leave that comfort, the hypocrites. But three from amongst them, the companions of the Prophet, Kaab and the Malik at the head of them, they stayed back also and they didn't have an excuse. And Kaab and the Malik said, I perhaps may make an excuse when the Prophet came. But he realized if I went and told the truth, if I went and lied to the Messenger of Allah and made a fake excuse so he could forgive me and show repentance upon me for me missing the battle, I know Allah will expose me one day and will humiliate him as Allah Ta'ala did in those verses that he didn't continue to recite, that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala spoke ill of those hypocrites who lied to the Prophet, that Allah knew their real reason why they stayed back. So this story talks about their repentance and their truthfulness to Allah and His Messenger, and their truthfulness to the Deen of Islam, and how Allah forgave them after 50 days had gone by. Because when Allah Ta'ala says, وَعَلَى ثَلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا and for those three who stayed back, meaning those who, those three individuals who came straight to the Prophet and told them the truth, for Messenger of Allah, we have no excuse for what we did. We asked Allah to forgive us. We was at the best of our finances, a situation that had no reason for not missing this battle. And the Prophet said, we're going to hold on, off on responding to you until you repent. I mean, until Allah decrees something to be done for you. And if Allah waited 50 days to make judgment on them. So that was what was meant by Allah delayed, they were held back from their repentance being accepted. Whereas the hypocrites came to the Messenger of Allah and made up some lie why they didn't come up. And the Messenger of Allah accepted from them. So they got their response immediately. But the companions, those three companions, what well, theirs was delayed for 50 days and Allah showed repentance on them. After they had reached this characteristics of of the, the, the three conditions, or some scholars say five conditions of repentance became real with them. And Allah Ta'ala accepted their repentance. And this ayah was the day when Kaabi Malik decided he will never say nothing out of his mouth but the truth because the truth saved him instead of lying to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To the point that there was no ayah that was revealed or situation that took place that dealt with truthfulness like that eye because in the end of that story Allah Ta'ala says Kunu be with the truthful be with the people who are truthful to Allah and His Messenger who meaning those who their belief matches their actions perfectly and truthful so this eye is a tremendous eye which inspired I guess the brothers here at the, at the college to ask us to talk about this subject matter and the story of Ka'b ibn Malik, there's so many benefits from it. Like Shaykh Ruthaymeen, in his explanation of Riyadh al-Saliheen, he talked about this long hadith of Ka'b ibn Malik in nine pages, just explaining that one hadith and abstracting the benefit from it, which in itself will be several classes. But however, today, inshallah ta'ala, the subject matter is about sinners and their cure which really all of us are sinners. Because Allah Ta'ala's Prophet said, Kulli bani Adam al Every one of the sons of Adam, Adam are sinners, make mistakes and make errors. But the best of those who make mistakes are those who repent to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. And in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made clear that if we weren't going to sin, 
But we weren't sinners. He would get rid of us and bring up people who would sin and repent back to our law. And repent to a why? Because oftentimes, adversity can make an individual become a better person than they were before that adversity. Sometimes the level of repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be so sincere and so high that it can make that individual become a better person than he was before he committed the sin that led him to repent. To such an extent, some of our righteous predecessors, our seller, they said, one sin can be better for a believer than a hundred and thousands of good deeds because of what it may do to that individual returning back to Allah to, with submission, returning back to Allah with submitting to him in obedience, and returning back from what was in them a fall and misguidance and rectifying their affairs. So this is the nature of the Taliban, of repentance. To such an extent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He ordered us in the Quran to have this quality in our hearts and upon our limbs of constant returners to Allah. Constant individuals who perfecting their submission to Allah and trying to fix it. As Allah Ta'ala says, Anibu ila rabbikum wa aslimu la. And return back to your Lord in repentance, in rectification, and submit and submit to Him. So these particular qualities is the quality of a believer. That's why a believer never gets stuck on stupid, as I like to call it. When he committing a sin, when he's staying on that sin, and he can't abandon that sin. That's not the attribute of a believer. Yes, we all fall into sin, no doubt. But a believer, when he falls into sin, he don't get stuck on that sin. Because he knows he has a Lord that is always showing forgiveness. He realizes he, he doesn't give up in the mercy of Allah. And he understands. So this subject matter is an expensive one that we could get into many areas of. But the first thing when we talk about a cure for sinners, it stems back to knowledge. It stems, rather everything in life leads to knowledge. Every time anybody achieves something and becomes successful in life is connected to knowledge. It's connected to some type of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made repentance or the cure for our problems is knowledge. And he made the cause of all our problems is ignorance. And that don't just play out into religion. It plays out into life. Like they used to say, you either going to go to school and spend money and do, learn how to do things, or you're going to learn the hard way and spend money for making many errors and learn how to do things. Lack of knowledge and being ignorant is something that nobody likes to be described. Even a person who's ignorant don't like to be called ignorant. But that's the key to everything. Ignorance is behind all problems that of befalls people. And knowledge is the connection to success in life. No matter what facet of life is. If an individual relating to worldly affairs and becoming educated, professors and, and inventing, it's all connected to some knowledge. Likewise, the cure to sinners fixing their sins is knowledge. That's why Abdurrahman al Sa'di. The teacher, Sheikh Muhammad Saleh, what does they mean? He said that Shaytan, our enemy, say, he comes to us from two doorways. He comes to us from the door of shahwa, a desire, a passion, something he coveted. Or he comes to the door of shubaha, some doubt, something you don't know about. So he play with a play with you in that area you don't know. And a cure for that is knowledge. Knowledge helps prevent you from your desires because you understand the end result of what will take place if I follow my desires. 
How will they give you a temporary pleasure now, but it will have a terrible result at the end or in the long run? Knowledge enables you to see what you get from what knowledge requires and provides for you. Likewise, knowledge enables you to see your way through doubt and confusion. It helps you see the proper route to go. Whereas, if you don't know, Shaitan can come to you and confuse you and cause you to fall victim to some doubtful matter in an area that you don't understand. Knowledge removes both of those particular things. So knowledge is the cure for the sinner. Having knowledge of his Lord, of his names and his attributes and how he deals with his creation and how he deals with sinners. So this is, these are the key to how a sinner cures his problems. So for that reason, we wanted to talk about the origin of sin. We wanted to talk about the origin of sin. That sins, Ibn Qayyim mentions in a tremendous book of his that has been translated to English. It has been translated, alhamdulillah, but that should have been translated with explanation. He mentions he has a chapter in his book called, the name of the book is called Adat wa Dawa, Diseases and Their Cures. That's what he titled the book. And the book was written by this author because Ibn Qayyim, a man, had wrote him a letter. In this particular letter, he mentioned to Ibn Qayyim and Josia that he commits sins. And no matter how much he tries to fix and repent and leave that sin and rectify his affairs, he finds himself going back to those sins. And he can't leave it no matter what. He tried many methods and he didn't have an ability to come out of it. So I'm asking you to help me. He was seeking a legal verdict for him on how to fix his, how to remove himself from his sins. So it led to him writing this book that he called it Jawab and Kathy. He gave it two names. He called the book Jawab and Kathy Liman Sa'ala An al Dawa al Shafi. The, su the sufficient answer for the one who asked about a cure, a, a healing cure for his sickness. And he, then he also has been given the title, The Disease and Its Cures. So he wound up, his answer wound up becoming a book. And Ibn Qayyim al Josiah was a great major scholar of Islam who lived over 800 years ago, or about seven to 800 years ago. And one of the chapters he has in his book is entitled Aswad Dhuru, The Origin of Sins. The Origin of Sins. The Sheikh says in the beginning of the book, since sins are mutafalita, they are different, there are many different types in many levels, in different levels, and in different levels of in, in their corruption. And also they have different punishments in this life and in the hereafter. He says, so we're going to mention in regards to that with the help of Allah and his excellent granting of success a abridged, concisive explanation of the origin of sins. He says, Asuha Nawan, that the origin of sins are two. Turkul Ma'mur wa fi'lul mahdur. And we had something that we wanted to bring up on the board if it was possible. What is up? Oh, mashallah. He said, that the origin of sin are two types. Leaving off commandments of Allah and His Messenger. As we put it, leaving off ordinance of Allah and His Messenger, to abandon them. And executing prohibitions of Allah and His Messenger, that which they prohibit us from. This is the origin of sin. He says these two are sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested 
the father of gens and mankind. Who are they? Adam, and who was the father of gens? Iblis. And how did Allah Ta'ala test him with these two? He said to Adam, he said to Iblis, Iblis was the one who abandoned the commandment of Allah. Allah Ta'ala said to him, Usjud li Adam, prostrate to Adam. He refused. He disobeyed. So he he abandoned a commandment, an ordinance from Allah. And Adam, he did a mahdur. He committed an act of disobedience. He executed an act of prohibition of Allah. When Allah ordered Adam not to eat from the tree. Ibn Qayyim says, so these two are the origin of sins. The sins branch off from these particular two things. Is either doing is either something that you are doing that you've been prohibited, you committed an act of pro a prohibition that you was commanded by Allah and His Messenger not to do, or you have abandoned something that you've been commanded directly from Allah and His Messenger to do. These are the origin of sins. This is where they stem from. They connected to these two things, and the first to ever do that was the father of jinn kind and the father of mankind. And these two particular sins, based upon the consideration of the place where the sins are committed, which are on our limbs, right, and in our hearts, for us, we have apparent sins that come off of our limbs, from our tongue to our body parts. And then you have hidden sins, which are belief, that which is in your heart that has been deemed as sinful to believe like this particular way. Sins that we fall into in these two origins come from either your limbs or from your heart. Either by you doing something that you've been prohibited from doing or you abandoning something that you've been commanded to do. Whether that be in your belief or whether that be in your actions. For these two particular things are the origins of sins. And so Ibn Qayyim went on to say, those sins are directly connected and linked to either the haqq of Allah, the right of Allah over us, or the right of his creation, violating their rights that Allah has allotted to them in this dunya, this worldly life. But the reality is even the rights of the human beings is the right of Allah. We just call it the rights of Ruqayyim al Jawziya says the rights of human beings because of the fact that these are things that every human being may request from another as a right or may let it go. So we say that's the right of the human being, but in essence, it's the right of Allah. Because us as believers, we are commanded by Allah to give the creation a right for the pleasure of Allah, seeking his pleasure, not to please them, so as to get a reward. So these particular things really goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the scholars of Islam has defined a per person that is solid, that is righteous, is a person who give Allah his rights and give the creation their rights. That's a righteous individual who gives Allah his rights and the creation their rights. So Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah, he went on to say that these sins that branches from these two origins. Leaving off what you've been commanded or doing something you've been prohibited from. Those things are broken off into four categories. Inshallah, we can change to those four categories. They break off into four categories. The sins that we commit is either going to be a sin that is malakiyya, and we're going to explain them. Kingship type of sins. Or sins that are shaytaniyya, satanic type of sins. Or sins that in Arabic they call it as sabu'iyya. Which we translated that as transgressive sins. Transgressing against others. And the fourth 
type of sin is bahimiya. Those are beastly sins. We want to explain each and every word. Ibn Qayyim explains it. And he begins with the dhulub that are manakiya, kingship sins. They are sins that a person commit that is not suitable for anyone to do and take on, which is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The right of saying you have the attributes of, of, of lordship that is only befitting of Allah. Taking off this kingship role that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right. Claiming Godship. Characteristics of magnifying yourself and giving yourself characteristics that is not befitting. Claiming omnipotence. Claiming things that is only suitable for Allah. Enslaving the creation to worship you. And the likes of that. Like pharaohs, like the pharaohs have done. And still exist to this day. And enter in this is associating partners with Allah. Worshipping others along with Allah. And shirk, associating partners with Allah is broken off into two categories. You either associating partners with Allah and his names and attributes by giving his creation qualities that is only befitting for him. Or calling them by names that is only befitting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or by making others as deities along with Allah. For this is polytheism. So that's the one category of shirk. The other category of shirk is that will enter the people into the hellfire, which all any associated partners will enter an individual into the hellfire, is in one's dealings and transactions, doing deeds for the pleasure of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These particular things are sins that Ibn Qayyim is described as malakiyah, sins that are only rights that is for the king of the universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the law maker. He is the judge over mankind. And it's not permissible for us to participate in these types of sins. Ibn Qayyim says that this category of sinning is the worst type of sins that could be committed, which is associating partners with Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, man yushrik billahi. That whoever associate partners with Allah, that the Prophet said that whoever associate partners with Allah, Allah will haram alayhi jannah. That Allah will make paradise prohibited for them forever. Those who worship others along with Allah, giving the creation a right that is only befitting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or becoming arrogant is from these characteristics. This is why the Messenger of Allah said, will not enter the jannah. The one who has in his heart an Adam's must see size of arrogance. The Prophet said an arrogance is looking down upon the people and rejecting the truth. As the Prophet said, Al Kibr, is looking down upon the people, seeing you to be above them, and rejecting the truth. For these are type of sins that mankind fall into that are of the four categories of sins. The second category of sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibit us from is the satanic sins, which is doing deeds that resemble what shaitan does, like envy, like, tra like transgression, like cheating, like being treacherous, plotting harm against others, Ordering people to do acts of disobedience to Allah and making it look beautified, making the haram seem fair seeming. These are satanic sins. Or prohibiting people from doing acts of obedience that Allah wants us to do. And making do being obedient to Allah tahjinahu, making it look repugnant and ugly. Oh, you shouldn't do that. When you do that, you look like this. Things like this. Like they say to Muslim women, when you cover, you, you, you look backwards. You look oppressed. Saying statements that will make obedience look ugly. Telling people when they do what Allah's Messenger commands them to do, that you look different from the people. These are all satanic type of sins. Because that is what shaitan does. He adorns the haram. 
He makes that which Allah and his messenger for him, it looks beautified, looks easy to do. And he facilitates it. He invites you to and make it seem fair sin. It was not that bad. Fornicating, adultery, and all the stuff that has that look in our society. They have gone so far with that that you see now you got three genders. Male, female, and transgender. Because they have adorned the haram to such an extent that it's okay to do it. They legalize the marijuana. Thing, many things has become legal. That is in the origin of the all religion is prohibited. But this is satanic type of sin that Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi is clarifying that that's satanic. Why? Because Satan or Shaitan, this is what he does. He makes the haram easy to do. He makes it seem fair seeming. He makes doing acts of obedience as something strange and repugnant and should be stayed away from. That's why in Islam, the truth stays the truth even if one person does it. The truth don't change no matter what the state is. That's why Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, Al Jama'a ma wafaq al haq wa in kunta wahda. That the truth is that which agrees what the, with the truth, what's been legislated, even if you by yourself in doing it. That's why during the time of Ibrahim, he was called the Ummah by himself, the nation by himself, because he was the only one on the planet on the obedience of Allah at that particular time, at a time in his life. Whereas in the society we live today, the truth is defined by what the people do, which is the essence of democracy. Democracy is the people rule. So if the people see something that once they saw as bad, they see it as good, it becomes good. <coughs> so this is what we call a satanic sin. A sin act doing acts of treachery, of deception, plotting harm against others, commanding with disobedience with Allah and making it seem fair seeming, prohibiting acts of obedience to Allah and making that look repugnant and ugly. Innovating in the religion, ibtida'u fi deen, that. In innovating in the religion of Allah, defining something as deen that Allah and His Messenger did not define as religion. Saying that it's good to do, once again, adorning it. <coughs> Making equals, uh, uh, also from this category, is calling to some innovation or misguidance and saying it's good for the people. These, this is the second category of what's of the four categories that sins fall into from those two origins of sins. As far as the third category that we call the sabu'iyya, we call transgressive sins. Those are the nubu'l-udwan, wal-ghadab, wal-sabqad-dimah, wal-tawathub ala al-du'afa wal-ajizin. وَيَتَوَلَّدُ مِنْهَا أَنْوَاعِ الْأَذَى النَّوْعِ الْإِنْسَانِ الْجُرْأَ عَلَى الظُّلْمُ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Ibn Qayyim says that this category of transgression, he defines it as sins of transgression against others and their rights. High rage and anger, spilling the blood of others unjustly, leaping and attacking the weak and the helpless, and springs from that many categories of human harm or harm to human beings, like ISIS and them other individuals who are upon that khawariji da'wah, that da'wah of that call of falsehood, being bold to, opp to oppress others and transgress against them. We call that saburiya. Saburiya in Arabic is in reference to animals. It comes from the word siba, suwa, which are sabwa, which are animals that have fangs and they, they for, for attacking their prey. Because they aggress and they, they attack their prey to kill them. So 
this category is being defined by that by Ibn Qayyim because that's what aggression does to others. You violate them having no respect for their rights as human beings and their rights that Allah has allotted to them in the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For this type of sin is the category of transgression against others. The fourth category is the Nubal Bihimiyya. We call that Bistu sins. Like Shara, Shara, or Shara, which is passion, desire, trying to fulfill your whims, your sexual desires. Being diligent to fulfill your lower desires for your private parts. Doing whatever is necessary to achieve that, whether that be sleeping with animals or have legal sex outside of marriage or doing acts that Allah has prohibited the human being to do that will lead to corruption of family and society, like we see today in the society we live in. To the point morality, in staying away from fornication and adultery and all these beastly behaviors has been removed from the educational system. Because that's what they want the society to become like. Your worth is not in your morality, it's in your degree. That should be attached to being moral. Islam has attached it as such. A perfect person's worth, worth is determined from his moral character, along with his achievements in the dunya. But our society is not like that. He's okay. He's, no matter, even though he slept with a bunch of women or men or whatever he's done, it's all right. He became rich and wealthy, so he deserved to be put before the people and lead them. This is why we find in the society we live in, immorality is becoming okay. 20, 30 years ago, a Kim Kardashian couldn't be famous, become famous the way she has. But the society has become immoral, and that's not an important portion part of society. To the point families are destroyed. Don't have family structure no more. Most people leave their families in old folks' homes. Because the morality of the society is destroyed in this category. Beastly type of sins. He said, are also from that is zina. What produced from that is adultery and fornication. What leads to that is sadiqah, stealing. What is a part of that is accurate and widely attained, eating the wealth of people of, and orphans unjustly. What bukhul, being stingy. What jubin, being cowards, hara, falling into disturbances like depression and wanting to harm others all of a sudden without any reason as we see in our society. People killing people don't even know why they're doing it. Why you kill them? I don't know. Uh, you laugh, but it's happening. People going to college and shooting people, they don't, there's no reason behind why they do it. Because they have left, removed the society from the morality that Allah wants for mankind that all three of the religions call to. Being moral, not fornicating until you get married. How covering your chastity, being modest, wanting for others what you want for yourself, for the sake of doing it only to please your creator because he will hold you accountable for that on the day that wealth nor money will, or status will avail you in it, but you will be judged. That type of belief will cause the society to desist and refrain from disobedience. But when you have no belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't believe in a hereafter. You don't believe that you will be held accountable if I mess it. Do whatever you want. And that's the society we live in today. And they don't understand why people murdering people are just going to schools and shooting and doing this. And they have no moral standards anymore. They have nothing to hope for of a, of a paradise and nothing to fear from of a hellfire. You've been created to entertain and enjoy yourself. So Ibn Qayyim, he says, هَذَا الْقِسْمِ أَكْثَرُ الذُّنُوبِ الْخَلْقِ بِعَجِزِهِمْ عَنَ الذُّنُوبِ السَّبُعِيَّ وَالْمَلَكِيَّ 
He says this category of sin is the majority of the sins that the creation commit. These beastly type of sins. This is the sin that majority of the creation commit because of their incapability of committing the sin of transgressing against others. Or of trying to be gods and people worship them and like this. And from this type of sin, the majority of people have fallen into today leads them to the other categories of sins that we mentioned. The other three. Because one sin leads to another. Like the son of a sin, when a person commits a sin, there are other sister sins hidden away waiting for you to do that one so it can make it easy for you the next one. You go from one stage to another stage to another stage like this. And likewise, when we do acts of obedience to Allah's messenger, and you persist in upon it, it leads to other good. That's the nature of Allah with his creation. That's why our society is worsening, is worsening with the passing of time. Because that's what sin is the nature of a sin. It worsens with the progression, with the progression of time. So Ibn Qayyim says this category is what most of mankind is upon and it leads them to enter into the rest of the categories. It pulls them into these other categories of sin like a ream can pull a person. Like you take a ream and put it on your animal and you pull it wherever you want to take it. Likewise, this sin drags them to the next sin. And that's why it's incumbent for the Muslims to learn their religion. So they understand the true reality of this creation that Allah put on this earth and understand the place of why things the way it is so you can put it in its proper place. That's why all knowledge must stem first from Allah, the knowing Allah, his names, his attributes, his qualities, what he loves and what he hates and what he commands what he prohibits from. Because in understanding that, it enables you to truly understand yourself and your place in society and why you was created and what is your objective with everything you do in this life because if you don't start with that knowledge because every other knowledge stems from that that you will misplace and misappropriate other knowledge this is why science is now used to change your gender this is why science is used and knowledge is used to make drugs and cigarettes and alcohol and legalize that stuff because they have knowledge that's misappropriated because they don't have the first knowledge which is the knowledge of the creator so all other knowledge is going to be misappropriated so Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi he went on to say وَيَدْخُلُونَ مِنْهُ إِلَى الدُّنُوبِ السُّبْعِينَ it will cause them to enter into the sin of transgression then to the, shape, the satanic sin. Then to manazah, to mububiyah, to the point they totally remove Allah from being their Lord. What is one of the fastest growing way of life that's happening in the world today is atheism. People leaving off the belief of God. And then it leads to associating partners in the oneness of Allah. And so Ibn Qayyim says, Man ta'ammal hadha haqqu ta'ammal That whoever reflects over this with a true reflection, it will become clear to him that sins is dihbiz of shirk. Sins is nothing more than a string that, lead, that led from disobedience to Allah. That leads from associating partners with Allah. That's why every society, when you find shirk increase in it, you will find oppression will increase in it. And for adultery will increase, fornication and adultery will increase in that society. And Allah in the Quran has described the believers without these characteristics. And the la yad'una is Surah Al Furqan. And the la yad'una ma Allahi ilahin akhar. Those who don't worship any deities along with Allah, call on any deities along with Allah. وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Nor do they kill a soul unjust except what Allah gave right to be killed according to the laws. وَلَا يَزْنُونَ Nor do they commit adultery or fornication. And whoever does that, يَلْقَى أَثَامًا Whoever does that, they will be met with a tremendous punishment. Ibn Qayyim said it in the tenth explanation of this verse, that these are the origin of all sin. This is the connection to all sins. 
that when you find a society you have shirt, you will find oppression in that society. And you will find fornication in that society. And the more the shirt, the polytheism increase, the more the other two will increase in that society. Whereas the just of Tawheed, when it's established, it established justice. That's why we study the beautiful history that we have, this Ummah, from what the life of the Prophet, his companions, and what they established in the two generations after that, you will find the ultimate example of what a society is supposed to be like. That, don't, that history has not seen before it and has not seen after it to this day. That the Ummah of Muhammad today is upon chaos because we have left that and fallen into these sins because we want to imitate here. And Allah deals with the believers different from how He deals with the disbelievers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with the believers when they disobedient, He gives them their punishment in the dunya. Whereas the disbelievers, the, the, the believers, He gives them their, their punishment in this life. So as to lessen their punishment in the hereafter. Whereas the non-believer, when they do their good deeds, he rewards them in this life so they have no good in the hereafter because they associate partners with Allah. So you see what we see going on in the Muslim world. All because of disobedience. To the point the Muslims have turned their back on the religion and believe it's backwardness. Allahumma sta'an. And Allah's help is sought. So understanding this, that if we understand these categories, Wallahi, and implemented them and guarded ourselves from them, it will protect us and keep us safe from falling into sins. And that will be our cure. Whether that's in your heart or upon your limbs, you will remove that from yourself. But it has to start from knowledge. It has to start from being educated. Just like you have to get education to do your, make your dunya better, Wallahi, you have to be educated in Islam to make your hair after better. No difference. No difference. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his first revelation to our prophet was what, y'all? Come on. What was the first? What's that again? Read. Why would that be the first revelation? Only because there's no way possible to know Allah without studying his religion. It's just like there's no way possible to become a doctor by just, I can do this. There's no way possible to become an engineer by just saying, give me them tools, I got this. I, I can handle this. I can rebuild this whole nuclear plant. I got it. Okay, brother, let me just go to another city while you do that. <laughs> just like that's the reality in the dunya, it's the reality in the hereafter. And we need to realize that. You want to be successful in Allah? You want to remove yourself from sins? Learn your religion. Learn what Allah says in the Quran. Memorize the book of Allah. Memorize, learn how to recite the book of Allah. Understand what he commands, what it prohibits from in his book. The way the people of the past were, not the way the Muslims want to interpret it today, which caused Muslims to leave Islam. They give their own spin to Islam. And the Muslims, unfortunately, many of us don't know how to distinguish what Allah and his messengers say from what the people do. Like that Arab woman who got a campaign against Islam. Because growing up, her family made her marry, her, made her cousin marry a relative that she did not want to marry. So she hated Islam. And the cousin set herself on fire when they forced her to marry her. So she blamed the religion, but Islam was free from that. Islam don't get a lot of that. One time a, man, a woman was brought to the Prophet by her father. And the, messenger of Allah, and the man said, oh, Messenger of Allah, my daughter refused to get married. So the messenger of Allah turned to her and said, obey your father. And so she said, no, not until you tell me the rights of a man over his wife. And when the messenger of Allah explained it, he gave an example for her to understand the seriousness of the husband's right. Because that's what she was concerned about. Which all of us should be concerned about. We should always, as believers, be concerned about of that the rights that people have over us more than we be concerned about our rights that we have over people. Because on the day of judgment, you would rather be in a situation where somebody did you wrong than you have done them wrong. Because the commerce on the day of judgment, our prophet made clear, the law of the Quran made clear, will be our deeds. You did somebody wrong, it won't be, I'm going to give them some money or a house or a no. 
He's going to take your good deeds. And if you run out of that, he will take, he will take that person's sins. So the believer, he's more concerned about the rights others have over him than his own rights. He's concerned about his rights, but he's more concerned about the rights that others have over him. So for this reason, you find that understanding this reality that the shaykh is mentioning here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant this ummah success like he did in our past when we was a superpower before, when we was obeying Allah and his messenger, when Europe had to come and learn education from the Muslims. The concept of college degrees, of having a shahada came from the Muslims. It didn't come from these people. The, the university, it came from the Muslims. We brought Europe, the Ummah of Muhammad brought Europe out of darkness, out of their darkness. When the Muslim ruler sent the watch as a gift to one of the leaders in Europe, and he saw that hand moving on that watch, he thought it was some devilish trick, and he threw it on the ground. And they had to send their people, like people come to America and got to learn English to go to school. People had to go to the Muslim world and learn Arabic to be educated about medicine, to be educated about um, engineering and various other things because the Muslims were obedient to Allah. And we became, based from our religion, great people that we are now not anymore because of what Umar al Khattab said. He said about the Arabs. In kunna qawman adalim, that we were a people who were humiliated before Islam. A'azzan Allahu bil Islam, and then Allah honored us with Islam. Mahma ibtaghayna al izza bi ghayrihi adalan Allah. And he said, as long as we seek might in other than this religion and nobility in other than this religion, Allah will humiliate us again. And that's what we live in today. The people back then understood that. So Allah allowed them to become leaders of the earth. If you only read your history. Not the ones that they tell us in these schools here. That's twisted. Much of it. Read your history. You will find that we were great people. High morals. We were the first people to have running water. Public baths. We invented the watch and time. Why? Because we had to determine the times of the prayer. We were the first ones to, to discover the map, of the, make the map of the earth. The first people to make the map of the earth. Why? Because Muslims would have to travel to make Hajj. So they had to map their way there and back. So it led to them making a map of the world. We achieved greatness, but it stemmed from the practice of Islam. Muslim doctors discovered that we were, we were the first to discover that we had a nervous system under our skin from the Quran when we saw the verse. One of the doc Muslim doctors, because back then, the school education, you had to learn Islam from kindergarten until, as we would say, to college. So when, by the time you got out of high school and you went to pursue something else, you was a memorizer of the Quran, you spoke Arabic fluently. It was a part of the system, the educational system. So the doctors were very educated in their religion. So they would refer to the Book of Allah. And one day, one particular doctor, he came across the verse in Surah Ta'ali Imran. Excuse me, Surah Tanisa. Where Allah Ta'ala says about the people in the hell fire. Kullama madhijat juluduhum. Every time their skin become burnt up. Baddalnahum juludin gairaha. We gave them a new skin. So that they may be able to taste the punishment. It won't, they won't lose it. Because you know, if you take, if I go to any one of us, or you right now pinch yourself, it's going to hurt. Somebody come and pinch your skin. It's going to hurt, but if they continue to do it, you stop, they stop hurting. You get a, a accustomed to it. <coughs> Allah in the hellfire mentioned that he will renew that skin so that punishment will stay fresh. And he will, and the Prophet said Allah will double that skin in thickness. So, that, so he said, well, there must be something under that skin to make us be able to feel. And he discovered the nervous system and made the first chart of that. So our deen betters your dunya, but only if you really understood it and practiced it. 
This has been lost from us. We're being told something different. So Muslims leave off this side. Because, like we said, it's being implemented by the most ignorant of us. And we have put that in some of the Muslim society cultures. Forced from marriage and forcing and doing. All this stuff is bothered. So in that hadith, when the Messenger of Allah told the girl to obey her father when he told her to get married, and she said, no, not until after the Messenger of Allah, you clarified for me the rights of the husband over the wife. And when he clarified it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by giving an example, she realized I'm not the type of woman that can handle being married. So she said, I'll never get married with Messenger of Allah. So when he, she said that, the Prophet turned to the people and said, do not marry the women except with their permission. But if you don't know the religion, shaitan come to you with this doubt. See how Islam is? They force you to get married in Muslim countries. Islam ain't no democracy. Where what the people say to find that. Islam is call Allah, call the Rasul, call the Sahaba. They said the Tawidi. That Islam is what Allah says, what the Prophet said, what the companions of the Prophet said and understood from the Prophet without any ambiguity in that. That's Islam. Not, I'm born Muslim, I grew up in this country, I know Islam. How you make wudu? <laughs> you see them do some crazy stuff. That's not how the Messenger of Allah taught us how to make wudu. That's not how his companions make wudu. And this is why it's important to learn this religion. And understand the cure for the sinner is knowledge. If he understood the reality of sin, he wouldn't do it. If he understood the end result that it will take him to, he will stay away from it. But if he don't have that knowledge, it's okay. Jay Thomas said, no man, it's not that bad. Nobody watching. Go ahead. Everybody else doing it. Why not? Feel free. You free. <laughs> like this society said, we call this the free world. That is a trick of Jay Thomas. Free in this society is what the laws say is free. For example, freedom of religion, freedom of who you want to be with, freedom of what you want your identity to be. That's okay because the society is okay. Why can't I? You got people out there like they say it's okay to be practice homosexuality. Marry, men marry men, women marry women. That opens the door for the people who want to be practice pedophilia. Why can't I practice that? I feel free. You better believe there's a group of people right now pushing to legalize pedophilia. And it's probably gonna happen. Look at our society right now. If I go on the internet and I try to watch child pornography and the police find it, I can go to jail. But at the same time, if I go to a nudist website where they got new children on it, that's not illegal. Did y'all know that? That's not illegal in America. But see, when you have these type of loopholes, you can play like that. No, no, no. I wasn't on no child watching child for the new That was a nudist website. That's legal. Right now, you can type and don't do it. You can type it on the internet, nudist website. You will see children, women, men naked. That's okay, but I can't watch new pictures of outside of that. This, that stuff is based on falsehood, and falsehood only leads to falsehood. And you better believe they probably will legalize it eventually. Because these things are pushed by what the law say is free, not what, what your Allah says is free. So, from there, and this is going to be a tremendous benefit. I don't know how much time we've been going. Because I know I'm long with it. So, inshallah. So, from there, when it comes to sins, that we need to understand that in Islam, anytime we commit a sin in the religion of Allah, you consider it as jahil, jahil, as ignorant. Even if you know the prohibition of that sin. In Islam, you're still deemed as ignorant. Some of our salaf, our righteous predecessors, they have clarified 
from the ayah in the Quran in Surah Al-Nisa where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى اللَّهِ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ سُوءَ بِجِهَانًا That repentance is upon Allah to be accepted upon Allah. Allah made it oblivion upon Himself they only accept repentance from those who do evil acts out of ignorance. So the first thing will come to the mind of the person who didn't read the explanation from the prophet or his companions. will say, well, you know, if a person commit fornication, he didn't know it was haram, Allah will accept his repentance. But if he knows it's haram, then, you know, that individual now is doing a major act and he know better than that. And he ain't gonna have his repentance accepted. Because Allah says that Allah only shows repentance upon those who commit sins out of ignorance. Qatada from amongst the tabi'een, he said, Ejma'a ashabu Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anna man, anna ma, anna kulla ma usi allahu bihi fa huwa jahad. That he said that there's a consensus from the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that every time Allah is disobeyed with any form of disobedience that that is deemed as jihad, as ignorance. And that the one who does any act of disobedience, he is deemed as ignorant. Why? That would have to, have to clarify what does ignorance mean in this case then. The scholars of Islam have explained that ignorance is two types. You have <clears throat> being the lack of having knowledge of the, benef the, uh, of the beneficial truth. Lack of having knowledge of the truth of what Allah and His Messenger command. Right? And the other category is Lack of having knowledge of what the religion requires and necessitate in that area of knowledge of that particular thing. For example, when an individual disobeys Allah, he is either not, he lacks observing, practicing what he knows. And in Islam, when knowledge is defined by practicing that which you know. That's why some of the sons used to say, Ma zala alimun jahila, that a scholar never, a knowledgeable person never sees being deemed as ignorant, hatta ya'mala bi ilmi. Not until he practices what he knows. So even if a person knows something he don't practice, he's still deemed as ignorant. Because he obviously don't see the reality of what that disobedience will lead to, of, sin, of, diso, of, of punishment. What it may lead to of harm to him in this life and in the after. Because he wouldn't commit it. And as long as he don't practice what he knows, then he's considered as ignorant. Knowledge in Islam is that what you practice. That's why the origin of our religion is to learn, practice what you know, and call to what you practice. And be patient with the difficulty that you receive in doing that. Not you go do actions and look for justification for it in, some, in the deen. That leads to innovation. And in the religion of Islam, for that reason, when you don't practice what you know, it leads you to forgetting it, what you know. And it leads to you abandoning it. And that's why the person still is deemed as still ignorant. And many of us should never get caught up to being amazed by the tongue of a speaker. Not until you see his actions. As Imam al-Shafir, he said, La do something correct. Do not believe a person, man, in what they say. Even if you see him walk on water, you see him fly in the sky. Don't believe him until you see his actions. You watch the sunnah. It's in the, his actions is in agreement with the sunnah. He's practicing what he's calling the people to. That's the sign, and that's important for us to understand. So when we see a person practicing what he knows, we say that's a knowledgeable person. And it becomes apparent in his behavior. It becomes apparent in his dealings with others that he's knowledgeable. 
So in Islam, knowledge is always coupled with action. Every, almost every place in the Quran when Allah mentions belief, he connects with it what? Righteous deeds. Those who believe and do righteous deeds. Meaning those who follow that belief up with actions and application of what they believe in. Likewise, this is the same case for secular education. You go to college, you get an education, and you get a degree. If you don't practice that knowledge and work in that field, you're going to forget that stuff. That's why a doctor, after going to school, what's the first thing he got to do before he get the official doctor signature? He got to do an internship. He got to practice that knowledge. Likewise, you learn something, you have to implement it in the deen of Islam. And if you don't implement what you learn, you're still ignorant. That's why the Salaf made this statement. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَفِرْ رُوِ إِلَى اللَّهِ And flee to Allah. Meaning flee from these things. Not observing your knowledge with practice. And lacking and knowing what that knowledge necessitates for you to do. And lacking and knowing the harm of disobedience. So it's important for us, if we want to be successful and cure our sins, it got to stem with learning who Allah is. Like we say to every new person who take their shahada. We don't say, you know, sister, when she takes her put on it, you got to put on that shimar. We tell her about those things, but if she's not doing, we don't focus on that. Like we focus on teaching her who Allah is. We let them know what she's supposed to do. But the focus is teaching her about how to believe or teaching that brother how to believe in Allah and his messenger. How, what, what, who is Allah? What is his quality? What is his attribute? What Allah loves and what he hates? So that he will begin to love his creator. Because the nature of something you love, you stand to give that thing you love his rights. So if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will give him his rights. Then it becomes easy to do what he commands. It becomes easy to stay away from what he prohibits. It becomes easy to turn away from the things that you attach to that Allah don't like. Because your love for him has grown in your breast. This is how sins become abandoned. This is how you turn away from a sin that you've been doing forever. It's learning who your creator is, who sees you 24-7, what you think, what you feel, and what you do. And what you would be doing even if you never do what he knows. And understanding this is where our protection lies. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we have more to say, but time is short. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of, of those who hear the speech of Allah and His Messenger and follow it in the most excellent way. But they are those who are guided. May Allah make us of those who's guided. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.